and welcome to History Through Fiction, the podcast. I'm your host, Colin Mustful, and today I am thrilled to be joined by Robin Oliveira, author of the novel A Wild and Heavenly Place. Robin, thanks so much for joining me. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I wonder if you could just start with your characters, Samuel and Haley. Um, tell us who they are and the, the circumstances that kind of uproot their lives. Well, there are uh, two protagonists in this novel. One is uh, Samuel Fittis. He is a 17-year-old young man when we meet him. He has fled Similum Orphanage in Lanark, Scotland, taking his five-year-old sister with him. And when we meet him, he is in one of the tenements down on Argyle Street in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, just trying to survive trying to find a way to make his way in the world without any family. Uh, he meets Haley McIntyre. He's had his eye on her at church. Haley McIntyre is a beautiful young woman from a very wealthy family. Uh, she comes from the west end of Scotland. He comes from the east, uh, west end of Glasgow and uh, she, he comes from the east end in in Scotland, then the, the poor were up, put up on the mezzanines of the church. And so he has spent his time in that mezzanine on uh, church days, looking down at uh, Haley McIntyre and falling in love with her. She's very distinctive. But then he uh, they're hanging around after church. The sun has broken through a dry Scottish day, as they say. And uh, there are some kids are playing soccer, including Haley's uh, younger younger brother and a runaway carriage comes hurtling down the street and uh, Samuel rushes in and saves uh, Jordy, her brother. And that is how their life together begins. And then what leads them both to the Pacific Northwest and in the United States? Well, they, um, there was a bank failure in Scotland at that time. And Haley's father is a coal mining engineer. In 1878, uh, before the bank failure, there was an explosion at a place called High Blantyre. 258 uh, men died in that, in that explosion. And I made Haley's father, Harold McIntyre, uh, the supervisor, the, the, the guy in charge. He's devastated by this. Uh, he's, he's a little bit unseated. Uh, and then the Bank of Glasgow fails and he loses all their money. And so he, in his sort of confused need to right the wrong of the explosion and to sort of, you know, hide from the shame of his, uh, what he considers his responsibility, they head out to Seattle, Washington, which was Washington territory at the time. And she, uh, Haley McIntyre and Samuel are wrenched apart. Samuel, who has a great deal of native intelligence, has uh, started building dinghies on the River Clyde. If you had a, if you uh, were living in Scotland at the time, really anywhere around the world, you knew that any boat built on the River Clyde in Glasgow was considered one of the best ships in the world. So he's Samuel, heartbroken, is trying to make a uh, way for himself and his sister on uh, in shipbuilding. And then he discovers that because of the class system in Scotland, he is not ever going to be able to become an architect of ships. He can't afford to go to college. And he makes a leap of love, I guess I would say, and follows Haley and her family uh, across the world to Seattle. And I kind of want to, I want to dig in more into the setting. You've kind of told us about where they came from in Scotland and in Glasgow. Can you talk more about the setting of Seattle and the Pacific Northwest and Washington Territory and what was going on in the territory at that time that would lure immigrants like Haley and her family? So Seattle was a, a very rough and tumble place. There weren't even 3,000 people at the time uh, that... Uh, um, Haley and Samuel arrive, they arrive at different times. But what was happening at the time is that uh, immigrants were coming from all over the world. 
with that sense that to this frontier town with the sense that they could make uh, it the largest city on the West Coast. They called it New York by and by. That was their intention. And what was available to them were uh, the natural resources of fishing and, and uh, timber, but also coal, which is the thing that lured Harold McIntyre. So there were people coming from Norway. There were Chinese who had come for the gold in California and then came up to try to take money, make money to send home to uh, China to their families that they've left behind in China. And to anyone really who had an idea that they could go to this unformed place and uh, establish a foundry or establish a business, establish some way for them to gain wealth. And in bringing your characters to the area, um, you cover a lot of historical events, including the Great Seattle Fire of 1889. Um, tell us about that fire and the role it plays in the lives of your characters. Okay, I'm going to correct you on that because oh. um, that it was a fire in 1879. And you're not wrong. There was a Great Seattle Fire in 1889. But there was also, through my research, I discovered that there was a lesser fire in 1879 when uh, my characters land. And it burned about, um, Seattle wasn't very large then, it was all made of wood, and it burned about half of the commercial district, a big block and a half warehouses and businesses. So um, I can't remember your original question now that I've uh, now that I've uh, made that correction. Well, I was just curious to know more about that event and then the role that it plays in the story here for your characters. Okay, so um, that event was it's. I had it. Um, I described it in a previous manuscript uh, from beginning to end. Uh, a kerosene lantern fell over in a hotel called the American Hotel, uh, supposedly in a tinsmith's room, visiting tinsmith. That hotel was owned by a man named Henry Yesler, who's a very prominent, um, I guess you'd say, a prominent person in Seattle at the time. He's, his name is all over Seattle now. And uh, the fire started, and because Seattle was all wood, wood it burned down uh, much of the downtown district at the time. What happened was uh, there were there was a, a, a railroad, Seattle uh, and Walla Walla Railroad, that left from Seattle and went down and around and up uh, to the east side of Lake Washington, where coal mine was, where the coal mine where Haley's family lived and worked. And that cut off all communication because the engineer uh, James Coleman wanted to check to make sure that the um, the, the tracks weren't melted, uh, weren't in any way at, um, uh, at harmed by the fire. And so he, um, that there was about two or three days when the train couldn't go. And in that time, something very significant happens to Haley uh, that even though uh, Samuel has arrived, um, has actually, she has made a decision that has altered their lives forever. So you've made it clear through our conversation and just through your writing that you're very dedicated to the history and to maintaining a sense of historical accuracy and historical authenticity. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of maintaining that integrity for history while also creating a historical um, fiction novel with a deeper meaning and message for readers? Okay. Um, I like to maintain the integrity of the history because I think it's really important to have readers trust you. I like the idea of sending readers back in time and I find history compelling and I often go out and look, I make sure that I, uh, when I put my characters in a certain time period, I make sure that I do a thorough search to see uh, what can ha what's happening in history, what's happening in the world, what's happening where they live that would affect them. And in a sense, it gives me plot. So that it, it, that's a bit of a two-pronged approach. Um, 
I do take liberties with history. I uh, I add a second coal explosion and I move it about 13 years from 1892 into 1879. Uh, the reason I did that was just simply for novelistic uh, structure and to give me uh, a reason to um, sort of keep these two lovers apart. Um, I don't, uh, I have done that on a Occasion. I have moved uh, in my third novel, I moved a storm, uh, I think seven years, a large uh, snowstorm, seven years, just so I could get to the heart of what is important to the characters. Uh, because the explosion that I move in this particular novel um, resonates deeply with one of the characters and it changes their lives in an impactful way. And in that way, I... Um, find that I can um, maintain a certain sort of, um, I guess I can maintain a novelistic integrity um, as long as I own up <laughs> to the moving, to the changing of historical events in my acknowledgements. Can you talk a little bit more about your craft and kind of give us a look behind the curtain? Uh, how much research does go into your novels and what is your process like? How much research do you do before you start creating your characters? And and just what is the timeline from beginning to end for you in creating a story like this? So the uh, the research is uh, is it's ongoing. I don't do research at the beginning and then decide that I want to write a novel. But every novel is different. But for the most part, I'm thinking about character, I'm thinking about character desire, and I'm thinking about illuminating forgotten portions of history. So for this novel, I had an image of a house on San Juan Island, the ruins of a house that uh, made me start to think about writing a novel set partially on the island. Um, then I was thinking that what I really wanted to do was write a sweeping, epic, continent-spanning love story. So there was that element to it. And then I started to think about the history that I knew. This novel has the word place in the title. And uh, I am really a creature of place. And I like to illuminate and write about the places that I know. So that was how this particular novel started. I live on Cougar Mountain in Seattle, which is outside Seattle, about 13 miles, 14 miles. And there are coal veins and a coal mine that run through the mountain. I thought that would be really interesting. So I kept that in mind as well. I thought about my ancestry. I, uh, my family comes from Scotland, from up by Inverness. All those elements work together. And so then I had a lot of research to do. So I went to Scotland. I traipsed all over Glasgow. I traipsed all over Scotland trying to um, find the elements that would uh, make for a good novel. And that's what I understood about shipbuilding in Glasgow. I, uh, I took that element and then started to look at shipbuilding in Seattle. I did a lot of research in terms of just sometimes looking at newspapers, just reading the newspapers of the day through the Library of Congress, uh, American Memory Site. Um, and then I, um, I look at city directories. I look at old maps. I read old diaries. I plunge into census records. I uh, use as many primary resources as I can trying to formulate um, a fact-based narrative or a history-based narrative uh, while also writing my characters uh, into it. So it's um, some days, you know, it's a, it's a whole half a day just trying to figure out whether, whether or not what the water system was in Seattle that ends up sending me to uh, Seattle city government people who end up showing me the 1890 uh, book that was written on uh, the Seattle water system at the time. I end up, you know, I ended up looking at old maps of Newcastle trying to figure out what the water system was there 
and found somebody whose family dug the well that exists there now and told me when and what happened before that. So a lot of it's uh, phone calls, a lot of it's um, connecting with experts. A lot of it is just um, due diligence in the sense that I'm willing to um, look at schematics of the old city to try to figure out uh, where everything was so that when I finally come down to write the novel, not only um, have I learned the history well enough so that it's not history I'm telling, but it becomes the character's lived experience. But I'm also able to throw off a phrase about how the water was, you know, the pail that she had to take to fill up the water, because I know exactly where that uh, where that well was or where the spring was that they were getting uh, their water from. So it's a combination of all of that. Well, that's incredibly fascinating and, and very admirable, just the work you put into creating such a such a great, authentic story. Um, you kind of touched on you know, your bat, your, where you live near Seattle, and you seem to have a, an affection for the Pacific Northwest that, that um, comes out in this novel. Can you talk about how, how much you enjoy that region and, and how you portray that affection in the novel? Well, I, um, I grew up outside of Albany, New York, and this is going to sound crazy, but in second grade, uh, Seattle had the World's Fair. And that Space Needle was in every newspaper across the country. And my second grade brain thought that that was really cool. So I decided when I was very young that I was going to move to Seattle when I was adult. Um, I spent some time in Montana at school. I went back to the East Coast. And then I finally moved back west and uh, decided that I absolutely had to live here. There's something about the mountains and the water that feeds my soul um and the San Juan Islands which are featured in this novel are I mean that and Paris it's just my two favorite places in the universe so I find that I where I am and place is very important to me I live in the same house I've lived in for 32 years now I can't ever imagine leaving here I am <laughs> I'm rooted to a place and this, you know, particularly here in Seattle, it's mountains and water and the, these cool rocky shorelines that aren't tamed. And so there's a sense of it being an untamed, it's sort of wild place that just speaks to my soul. I can't imagine ever leaving here. I think that's wonderful. I. I've had a chance to go out there a couple times, including a trip to Olympic National Park, and I was amazed at the variety of landscapes just within that park alone. Yeah, it's quite it's quite gorgeous. And to say nothing of the wildlife, because we have a bear who traipses through our backyard sometimes, and uh, bobcats and bobcat kittens and um, deer that come thundering through and coyotes out the window. So it... Uh, that really appeals to me. Can you talk about your journey to becoming an author? Um, I read that you were a nurse and that kind of contributed to your ability to write. Can you talk about how that made you a better writer? Okay, so I became, uh, I became a writer because I'm essentially a reader. I spent my childhood reading. My mother was kind of worried about me. But I, um, I read through the classics and spent my 20s reading. And I was, at the time, a nurse. And I became a nurse because I had, been in, um, I had studied Russian and studied in Russia at the time. And I wanted to work as a translator or to work for the UN or to work uh, even for the State Department. And it was the 70s, and none of those were open to me. So I applied to become a nurse, went through nursing school, and became uh, an ICU, CCU, bone marrow transplant nurse for, uh, for about seven years. Then I stayed home with my kids. And when my son went to kindergarten, it was time to decide, did I want to go back to uh, nursing or did I want to try to write uh, one of those things that I loved, which is a book. Um, 
I got into the nurses retraining and I got uh, into uh, writing classes nearby and I decided I would try to write and I had a very supportive husband. It took me a long time to learn. I went to uh, community college classes in the evening and then I went to uh, the University of Washington's extension and finally got an MFA in writing. And the MFA at Vermont College of Fine Arts really helped me to learn things that I didn't no, I had written a novel uh, during that process of being at the other schools and it didn't get published. I got an agent for it, but it didn't get published. And at that time I thought, okay, I know, there's something I need to know. I, I, there's something I need to know that I don't know yet, but the MFA was, was where I learned it. And I had been writing My Name is Mary Sutter, my first novel before I entered. I sort of took a hiatus during the two years there. And then three years after I graduated, uh, my first book was published and I was 55. Well, congratulations. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your MFA program and how it contributed to kind of advancing your career as a writer? Yeah, sure. Um, it was Vermont College, of, it was called Vermont College then. Um, it, it was a high level of discourse around writing. It was a very disciplined look at the words I was putting on the paper. It was, uh, I had a very <laughs> difficult teacher who turned out to be a very good friend. His name is Douglas Glover. He, um, he taught me how to structure a novel. He taught me how to look at what I had written with a very discerning eye, um, taught me how to kill my darlings, taught me all about repetition being the heart of art. And it was through uh, the constant questioning of what I was writing and the constant uh, critique that I took and the constant critique of others writing along, coupled with very intensive and directed reading that shaped my ability to write in a different way. And that was, um, you know, it was, it was, a, <laughs> I used to say it was like taking all my clothes off and standing up for um, people to, to criticize me, but it was this way of getting a, a very, um, down to a very primitive and primal brain so that I could rebuild it and uh, rebuild it with the help of my teachers and the other students. And it was, uh, it was fundamental, I would say. And now that you've kind of established yourself as a, a novelist, a successful novelist with a, you know, a New York Times bestselling author, can you talk about how that feels, the success, the rewards feel, and any advice you might have for other writers out there that are, are, are seeking the same kind of level of I don't know if it's success or if it's just uh, recognition within the field of, of fiction writing. Um, how did it feel? It felt, uh, I just have to say it felt validating. I mean, the, the first time I felt validated was I applied for a prize and I won. It was the James Jones First Novel Fellowship and Kaylee Jones, who directed, who directs that prize, um, called me to tell me, and I, I fell on the floor of my kitchen weeping because I had spent years trying to learn how to write. And she was saying, my novel wasn't finished yet. They only had 100 pages. But her, she said, keep going. You know, this is, that was the first keep going moment that I had. So having had some recognition, that was very helpful. When the book first came out, um, my husband will tell you two hours before I had to do my first event on publication day, I was lying in my bed with my sheets up to my chin because uh, I didn't know how the book would be received. And I, I didn't know if I had done a good job. I'm not actually sure if you ever know if you've done a good job, despite my training, I wasn't sure that. And then the book was all received and it made the New York times bestseller list. And it was lovely because I had tried so hard for so long and I really wanted to make a book. I really wanted to make one of those things that I loved and I had done it. Um, that was a, 
that was a very wonderful experience. Uh, I got a lot of praise from the outside, but then of course I had to write my second book. And it's always, you're always starting over from square one. The way you write your first book is not the way you write your second book, is not the way you write your third book. Um, so I just kept telling myself something that David Jouse, one of the teachers at uh, the MFA program said to me, and that was, um, and many people have said this, but writing is 90% resistance and 10% talent. And I now say to others that you just have to persist, but while you're persisting, learn craft. So I have never stopped learning craft. I never stopped reading critically. And I um, sometimes have to just remember persistence. It's 90% persistence because sometimes it's hard. And the only thing I know is that sometimes I sit down to write and everything works. And sometimes I sit down to write and nothing works. And I have learned to take emotion out of it in some sense, because how I feel about what I'm putting down on the page, I, I find myself very unreliable. I'm not sure it's valid. So I just keep going. I keep going and I keep going and I keep going. And then I reach the end and then I edit and read it again and edit some more and read it again and write another draft. And it's that persistence that that has worked for me, but I still continue to read critically. I still continue to try to be fed as much as I possibly can. Every writer has certain habits, and I read that you turn on an eagle cam while you sit down to write. Do you still <laughs> do that? And what other what types of animal cams do you enjoy? <laughs> well, I, I like watching the uh, the bears in Alaska feeding on salmon. Sometimes I turn that one on. And uh, there's an, <laughs> it's a very famous eagle nest down in Florida. And uh, they have eggs every, they start in December and go through. And you can watch the little ones fledge about May and wander around the pasture. And I'm actually sort of addicted to that camera. Um, my sister lives near there so she i went down to see her and she took me to see that she took me to see the nest it's a way of um it's a way of distracting myself so that uh, my critical brain can't get too busy while i'm writing if i if i get stuck if i'm not sure i just sort of take a peek and see what the eagles are doing and then uh go back to go back to writing can't believe you found that <laughs> and what are you working on next um, I'm this time I, this was an exhausting book to write. So I have taken some time off. I have an idea. I'm doing a lot of nonfiction reading right now. You asked me before about research. I know nothing. It's usually generally, I know nothing about what I'm going to write when I begin, but I know nothing about, uh, this subject that I have in mind set maybe in the 20th century. It would be my first novel in the 20th century but I'm just gonna leave it at that because it's a very new idea and I'm still not sure about it. Well, Robin, congratulations on A Wild and Heavenly Place. And thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, Colin, I really appreciate it.